Hello everyone, this is Bob Browner with Community Coronavirus Update number 22. Uh, today I want to talk a little bit about uh, balancing health and the economy and some ways adjusting to the new normal. There's a great uh, report out by uh, Tom Frieden again, so we'll talk about that. So uh, how are we doing in Nebraska? Well, I'd so results are kind of mixed right now. We, we look like we peaked a few weeks ago. However, uh, things aren't continuing to drop. Seems to be leveling out. Uh, there are some uh, regional variations. Omaha seems to be having an increase in cases again. Uh, so I'd say mixed reviews about how Nebraska as a whole is doing. Uh, uh, also, I'm a little worried about, again, that we're looking at hospitalizations and ICU capacity to make decisions, which I think is a mistake because the ICU stays today are based on what happened a couple of weeks ago and if this starts going back up again we'll be full and then even more full so uh, I would not be using hospital capacity as our decision ping making point but actually how many new infections are we getting because you can project forward a couple of weeks from now and figure out what the ICU utilization is going to be. How are we doing locally? Well, we had a drop, but uh, things are kind of mixed. Uh, actually, the state site already has us up at 995 cases. The dashboard hasn't been updated locally yet, uh, but essentially it looks like we're still getting at least 200 uh, or more cases of community spread. So on this bar, you'll see community spread. So it is spreading around our community. We're getting at least 200 new cases per week still. Uh, this week hasn't even closed out. So if you add those uh, 28 no new cases plus the rents that are coming in today and tomorrow, we'll probably well over 200. So we're not seeing a continued drop uh, so I'd say it's not it's a little too early to start saying we should start opening up more at this point uh, but on the other hand I think we need to start balancing a little bit it's is it doom and gloom versus optimism uh, we're probably going to end up somewhere my best guess between 300,000 to 3 million fatalities based on the virus and the range of that 300,000 to 3 million is based on how we act we actually can limit that to 300,000 but if we did absolutely nothing which we're not going to do it could be as many as three or even four million fatalities that sounds like a lot and that's worse than World War II or in that range or worse by the way on the other hand though 98 to 99 percent of us will be just fine so temper that this is not the end of the world uh, however we do need to take seriously this is this is as many deaths as World War II or more and so we also have to be cautious about it but at the individual level most of us are going to be fine so one way to look at this again I talked about this a few weeks ago about lives versus the economy uh, I wish we were had better economic projections how and this is certainly bad for the economy but how bad we're getting a better idea again uh, so another update as far as potential fatalities in a worst case scenario had we done nothing uh, Spain has is, is actually done some antibody testing of their population they, they found that about 5% of people seem to have gotten infected and if you take that roughly 5% divided by the number of fatalities we know that the infection and fatality rates probably in the one point 2% range. Well, if 100% of Americans got that, that'd be almost 4 million fatalities. It wouldn't get to 100% of Americans because we'd hit herd humanity before that would happen. What is herd humanity depends on this uh, infectiousness factor that I've put in here. And so if we divide those number of fatalities and let's say we do an intervention that prevents 80% of them, is it all worth it? Well, on the Harvard study a few weeks back, they had $225 billion per month, which is a hard number for a lot of us to understand. Uh, but one way we do this in, in, uh, in health economists would look at this is how, what's the cost per life year saved? And so the average life expectancy loss for someone dying of coronavirus is about 10 years. Uh, yes, there are a few people who would have, quote, died anyway, but there's also people who would have had 20 more years yet had they not gotten coronavirus. On average, it's causing losing people about 10 years of life expectancy. Well, if we do the math, it gives us a, a number that most of us can understand. It's hard to understand, you know, a million plus fatalities. It's hard to understand $225 billion a month. No, that's a that's a crazy amount of money but if you divide that all out it gives you a number that you can kind of sink your teeth into so $35,000 to $100,000 per year of life saved would you spend $35,000 to add another year to your life a lot of people might and so this is how a lot of health economic economists would make a decision that's how other countries decide you know are we going to cover this hepatitis C treatment cancer screening something like that so the amount of it at work we're doing to slow our coronavirus for 48 months is in that range so it's reasonable for us to keep doing this and not give up too soon uh, we've kept our fatalities it will probably be over a hundred thousand by the end of end of May uh, but we've averted a lot of fatalities and the studies are pretty conclusive on this that what we've done so far has worked so what are we going to do next? Uh, so Dr. Tom Frieden, a former uh, director of the CDC, has put out the uh, guide this week, which I think is really good. You can watch his CBS video, and I've linked it to the bottom of the YouTube if you want to watch it. And he talks about using an alert level that's very easy for people to understand. And, and so this kind of you know stoplight coloring works for many other things. People use this for air quality and asthma and weather forecast, for example. I think this is a good way for people to understand it. 
uh, we, we know that we're, we're in for this for the long haul. This isn't a one or two month thing. This is going to be uh, eight months, 12 months, maybe two years. We're going to have like, if it's like past pandemics, we'll have multiple uh, resurgences. How are we going to adapt to that? We may need to adapt locally based on local knowledge. Uh, and I think this is the method that I think I really like that he's proposed. Uh, he says that our alerts in this system should be, one, it should be easy to understand and the stoplights easy to understand. It should be transparent, so she, people should be a little more honest about how good or bad the data is. It should be based on good data, not based on I feel like this or this politician says that. It should actually be very data driven so people can understand. It should be practical, adapted to where you live, and very collaborative. Um, so example here in Nebraska, we know that's going to be varied based on where you live. If you're up in the sand hills, not much to be worried about. There's almost no spread. Some, a lot of counties have yet to have a single case. On the other hand, if you're near a meat processing facility or urban area, we've got hundreds or thousands of cases. So how I act in Lincoln, Nebraska is going to be very different than how I act in Garden County, for example. should be very local uh, and the decision should be local. Um, they, set, they have a new normal, low, moderate, high, and they tell you what to do based on what it is at kids versus at a playground or a school. Here's how you should act based on sort of the weather forecast. I think this is a very, uh, I think an intuitive way of looking at it. People can get this pretty quickly. Uh, and here locally at the Lincoln Lancaster County Health Department has been putting out a very similar. So you've got low, moderate, and high. We are in the high area. So this is not the time to be going back to movie theaters or to churches at this point when we still have this degree of community spread. So you should look at this weather forecast just like if I decide this morning whether I'm going to uh, bring my umbrella or my rain jacket. It depends on what the weather looks like and how you should act in the community again. It depends on this. And so I think this is a very good approach that most people would understand. Uh, one of our problems, though, is our data is still a mess. So uh, the CNN article or the New England Journal of Medicine, our data is old, it's slow, it's not updated very quickly. Just like I mentioned earlier, the state site gets updated at a different time than our local site, and New York Times, for some reason, seems to be faster. So why are we taking so long to update everything? Uh, there's problems about how tests are getting recorded. So we had 90 cases reported Monday that were all drawn the week before. So should those have been accounted toward this week or should they have been accounted toward last week? And why is it taking one to three days for us to get results back still? So our testing capacity isn't enough to guide us right now because it's still slow and incomplete. The other problem is I'm really getting a little frustrated with people putting way too much stock in some of these models. So the IHA ME uh, ME article uh, model that out of University of Washington, it's been proven wrong, you know, week after week. Why are people still putting so much faith in that model? Uh, and again, this New England Journal pr perspective has some criticism about that model and others. I think people are failing to consider one, the models aren't all, always accurate, so don't put too much reliance on them, but they're highly dependent on the decisions we make. So it really should look more like this. So Nebraska's cases, we know where we are right now, but how we're going to be weeks and months from now depends on a lot of things. It depends on the decisions of our political leaders. It depends on whether people actually do or do not wear masks, how they congregate. Uh, will it be seasonal or won't it? So still the range of uncertainty is far more wide. So if anybody makes a prediction now and says, oh, it's going to peak in three weeks, they're wrong. They don't know for sure that it's going to peak in three weeks because it's highly dependent on all of our collective decisions on whether that's actually going to happen. And even things we still don't know about coronavirus. So like will it be seasonal for example there's a lot of hope that it'll be seasonal uh, you could look down south and say well are they having drop-offs in cases well you can go to the site and see are they having drop-offs in cases so in louisiana they had that spike because of mardi gras dropped off but uh oh looks like things might be heading back up again same with florida they had spring break things were dropping up but uh oh they look like they might be going up again and then you have alabama you have texas to me these look like upward trends not downward trends and so either it's not seasonal or people are making bad decisions or both. So we don't have a lot of good evidence yet to show that this is going to drop off this summer yet. And if we look to the south, we can't necessarily uh, find any uh, conclusive evidence of that or at this point at least. So what are you going to do? I'd say right now face covering is still a big thing. So I feel like I have to keep saying this over and over again, but face masks are perfectly safe. I still, I, people say, well, can you respond to the arguments that it might be unhealthy? I, sure, but find me a good argument. I can't find a single study that actually backs up that wearing a face mask would somehow be harmful to your health. At the, flip, at the other side, we know that cloth masks have been used for over 100 years, and they've been very effective. And so, yeah, we wear surgical masks that are a little higher tech in the operating room suite, people with asbestos, that's a different respirator. But, you know, most of us grew up washing mash. Yes, that's a TV show, but here is Ellen Alda wearing that cloth mask. Well, that this is an actual mash unit where they, yes, they did wear cloth masks, and this has been used for over 100 years. Um, it's they've done military studies. Uh, so for example, we know how far, far droplets spread based on them literally putting Petri dishes on the floor spread out here. And if you're just talking quietly or breathing quietly, it's going to go mostly three feet, but as much as six. But if you cough, sneeze, yell, sing, it's going to go much farther. That's why you need to wear a mask. 
uh, if you really want to write, write, read the history of masks, it's been used uh, over 100 years. Uh, they've used them to, they used a, a washable mask to, to stop the spread of scarlet fever, diphtheria, polio, all kinds of things. So this is not a new topic. Uh, so Atul Gawande's article, great. Uh, I think still this is the best guide for a lot of us. You know, wash your hands, physical distance, not social distancing, physical. Wear a mask. We need to get better with our testing and some culture change. We just need to think this is a new normal. We're not going to go back to the way it was three months ago. Uh, so the new normal, we're going to start acting more like the Japanese and the Asians that wear masks more frequently. So, and again, the mask is not perfect, but it's like layers of Swiss cheese. You put enough layers of Swiss cheese, you're actually going to stop stuff. And so both people need to wear a mask, plus we need to wash our hands, plus we need to go to the right places. Uh, so the evidence is there. Uh, again, this article is linked again if you want to read through the evidence review on masks. Uh, so, but doesn't mean you have to wear a mask everywhere. So what do I do? I actually, places where I wear a mask, at the grocery store, convenience store, farmer's market, an off-site work meeting, I wear a mask. But I don't always wear a mask. I don't wear it when I'm on the bike path or walking my dog. Uh, if it's just Ted and I brainstorming and he's on the other side of the conference uh, table and we're looking at the whiteboard, we don't always wear a mask. And I don't wear the driveway social in the neighborhood. So uh, wear it based on local conditions and your own risks. Uh, I'm not going to go to a restaurant right now, uh, so the epidemiology on this is pretty conclusive where this person spread it to these people, these people, these people, these are some of many of these people are more than six feet away. Uh, again, you know, here's a, a call center, not too different than a theater or a church or something like that. So I'm not going places like that anytime soon while we're in this high risk spread right now. Now, maybe when we get to low, I'll be okay, okay with that, but I'm not going to do it right now. Uh, now, there may be some creative ways to get us to the restaurant. I want to go down to the Piedmont Bistro down the street. Uh, if they do some creative things, I would consider going to the outside seating, but I would not go to the inside seating. And here's some examples of creative ways. Uh, this is Germany where yeah, it started in the spring where they came up with these little greenhouses because the weather still wasn't that nice out. But it's a way to kind of give them a little bit of control, protection of the elements, but you could also isolate yourself and have a nice dinner. Uh, here's a bar where you could walk in, both people wearing masks, of course, pick up your drink, then go back outside again. These physical barriers might actually make a difference. So we can have some creative ways to open the restaurants short of doing it dangerously. Um, and so again, wear your mask. And, and again, you're not wearing a mask because of you. I am not, I'm literally not worried about getting coronavirus myself. I'm a pretty healthy 50 year old. I don't smoke. I don't have any heart disease or anything like that. I'm fit. I'm wearing a mask because I don't want it to spread to somebody else. My wife is seeing patients. She, she's done some trainings in Grand Island for some folks. So obviously that was a hot spot. So there's a chance she came home and infected me and I don't want to infect somebody else. So when I'm going to some place like G landscaping, me going in for two to three minutes, my risk of getting me getting coronavirus is almost zero, but he's got people coming in day in and day out. And I don't know about him. I don't know. Maybe he's a type one di diabetic. Maybe he's going home and his wife is going through breast cancer treating. Maybe he's taking care of his mom who has heart failure. So if I were to spread coronavirus to him, I might kill one one of his friends, family members, relatives, I'm wearing a mask because I care. I'm not wearing a mask because I'm afraid of anything because I'm not actually, I'm not that worried about getting coronavirus. But I also know that I have a lot of friends, families, members, relatives who could be at risk and could die from it. And I'll, the same thing goes for everybody else. He probably has friends, family members, and I don't want to infect him. So I'm wearing a mask because I care and I hope you will too. And there is no negative consequences of you wearing the mask as long as you wash it now and then. So hopefully this is helpful to you. This is uh, what I do for a living and various roles in the community. Uh, all these videos are put on the healthylincoln.org website. We also have a lot of those uh, logos and flyers. You can even drop your own logo into some of those things if you want to. We highly encourage you to, to promote mask wearing in your environment. Uh, and we'll see how things, hopefully our data gets better and we start making some good decisions. Uh, and uh, so we'll go from there.